Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. Today's video is a very exciting collab that I have been working on putting together for the last few months. We've had some hiccups and delays, but I'm finally doing it. I'm very excited to tell you all about it. A few months ago, you might have seen that the New York Times put out their list of the top 100 books of the 21st century. Now, I saw that list and I know some of y'all saw that list and I was like, mm, are these? the best books of the 21st century. This is not what I would have put on that list. So I thought it would be interesting to get a group of booktubers with diverse backgrounds and reading tastes together to collectively create what might be a better list of the top 100 books of the 21st century. So I am being joined by nine other creators and we are all giving you our top 10 books based on our preferences, based on what we've read that we think deserve to be on this list. And I am very excited for you to see it. I think we have an incredible lineup. There are so many amazing books on this list, so many great creators who read all kinds of different things. Hopefully you'll find somebody new to follow. They're all gonna be linked down below. Huge thank you to everybody who submitted a clip list. We'll be coming at the end of the video. So I hope you'll stay tuned and watch as all of these other creators present their top 10 books of the 21st century. Hey guys, I'm Tori from the channel Tori Morrow and thank you so much Bethany for including me in this very exciting collaboration. These are 10 of my favorite books of the 21st century. First up I have The City in the City by China Mieville. I think China Mieville does such a great job at blending a lot of different genres. We have dystopian elements and crime and thriller and it's just really incredible how all of it comes together and this has to be one of the most um, just really fun and dark and imaginative things that I've ever read. In this we have two separate cities that occupy the same geographical space and the citizens of both of these cities have been taught not to see each other but things for both cities take a turn when at the beginning of this book this young woman is found dead in one city and the detective that's assigned to her case has to maneuver through both cities in order to solve what happened to her and it just becomes one of the most tripped out things I've ever read. I thought this was incredible. Cannot recommend this enough. Next I have one of my all-time favorites and that is Lexicon by Max Berry. To this day I am still searching for a book that reminds me of Lexicon. Our main character in this, um, she has just been trying to survive on the streets, do what she can to get by in life, and she gets the opportunity to study at this school. But this is a really unique situation because at this school, instead of learning how you know to do math and science and all of that, they're learning how to use language as a weapon, uh, as a tool of manipulation, and it just becomes completely unhinged. We also have another storyline happening at the same time that you just have to read to discover for yourself, but how everything comes together in this is truly phenomenal and still to this day when I think about it this book blows me away. Next up I have another I was gonna say all-time favorite but actually all of these are my all-time favorites they're so incredible. Next up I have A Memory Called Empire by Arcady Martin and this is the first book in the Taxicolon duology. This is like what I love in science fiction. Our main character has to go to the heart of the empire after she learns that her predecessor has died and once she gets there she is just a complete fish out of water and has to you know maneuver politically and just try to stay afloat the best way she can while also trying trying to figure out what happened to her predecessor. I just think this is brilliant. I love a memory called Empire. I recommend it every chance that I get and it's by far not only just one of my favorite books of the 21st century but just one of my favorite sci-fi books of all time. This is incredible. Next up I have The Good House by Tanana Reevdu. Tanana Reevdu is a genius just on every level. Just her general storytelling style, her actual writing style, the craft, her structures, her characters, the themes. But in this we have our main character Angela. She's a grieving mother and she's also inherited her grandmother's home that's been in the family forever and the story is told in different timelines. We get past chapters that slowly begin to reveal what happened to our main character's son, but it's also told in the present day as our character is just trying to grapple with a lot of the horrors that are surrounding this uh, house that she's inherited. Next up, I've got Binti by Nnedi Okorafor. The way that Nnedi Okorafor approaches sci-fi themes, Afrofuturism, and the way she explores it through the lens of these really vulnerable characters is just so incredible. So our main character, Binti, she leaves home for the very first time and she's set to study at this university, but this is part space opera, so she has to travel on the ship to get there. While she's on this journey, the ship ends up being invaded. And from there, we're really working with Binti, not only trying to solve the problem, but just 
this new terror that she feels not only being away from home but also having to suffer these horrors by herself so I love this it's truly amazing and I would recommend this for anyone like looking to get into Nettie or core for or if you are just starting out on your sci-fi journey and want to explore and see what's out there you cannot go wrong with this next I have another sci-fi here more along the lines of literary sci-fi this is so incredible and that is how high we go in the dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu. So technically this is a novel, but it's broken up into a lot of different short stories that follow different characters, but all of them have one kind of overarching narrative arc to them. And it is so good. It is so, so good. I think the way Sequoia Nagamatsu approaches apocalyptic themes, uh, themes of humanity trying to just strive and, and persevere and still do great things in the face of uh, you know, terrible adversity. I think it's so incredible. This begins in Antarctica and we have a father who goes to pick up uh, where his daughter left off on her research. But the ice there begins to melt, releasing this virus that begins to spread across the world. And you're seeing how this virus is affecting people in different ways. The industries that are now created out of necessity because of this virus. This is so bleak and heart-wrenching, but at the end of the day, there's always that kind of sliver of hope of what humanity is capable of and what's possible. Next up, another favorite, one of the best in my opinion of the 21st century is Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark. This is genius. I've said this time and time again, but nobody could have written this except for P. Jelly Clark. We have our main character in this, Maurice, and she's a monster hunter. And Maurice and her crew, they hunt what's known as Ku Kluxes, and these are uh, monsters, demons that inhabit the bodies of these KKK members. And it just gets wild. I'm telling you, this is a must read. This is something I would recommend to everybody. Please go read this. It is fantastic. Then down to my final three now, one of my favorite fantasy books of all time, one of the best that I've just ever read is Jade City by Fonda Lee. I really tried to limit the number of like books in a series that I included on this list because the whole top 10 could just be books from my favorite fantasy and sci-fi series. Uh, but there's something so special for me at least and something so um amazing about starting the green bone saga fonda lee has created one of the best character studies i have ever seen in anywhere in fantasy and sci-fi and literature you come away from this series as a whole feeling like you know these characters better than you know yourself better than you know people in your real life it is something next level i know epic fantasy means different things for different people but in my opinion this is an epic epic family saga. I think this is just a masterclass in character work and world building and the fact that it all starts here in Jade City I think is just mind-blowing. And then next I have another author that I think is the best in the game and a book that I just is masterful in, in my opinion and that is The Grace of Kings and this is by Ken Liu and this is the first book in the Dandelion Dynasty series. I don't know anybody who is doing it quite like Ken Liu right now. I'm telling you this book is on a different level. This leans very very historical. It's almost like you are getting this deep and rich and thoughtful look at the history of uh, the islands that are a part of this archipelago. There's many lands in this empire but one island in particular and one ruler was responsible for forcefully uniting everybody. We as the reader come into the picture once that's already happened and this whole book is really about the seeds of rebellion and how people have been responding to this unification in different ways. We have a large cast here. This is epic scale world building. In the midst of that, we have two central characters in Kuni and Mata. So The Grace of Kings, cannot say enough great things about this. One of the best fantasy books I've ever read in my entire life. And then last but not least, this list would not be complete without one of my all-time favorites, and that is Stories of Your Life and Others by Ted Shang. And this is just genius. This is a short story collection. Every story in here hits. The way that Ted Shang grapples with and explores all of the different things that make that make us who we are is just so brilliant in this collection. We've got the deep exploration of religion and loss and memory and love and math and so much going on in this really incredible, incredible piece of art. This is my favorite book of all time. I will always and forever recommend Stories of Your Life and Others. This to me is like a book that I think everybody should read at least once in their life. Hi there, I'm Isabel from the channel Happy For Now, predominantly reading romance books, but also I dabble in other genres and love to read manga as well. These are my 10 books for the 100 Best Books collab. 
First up, we have A Princess in Theory by Alyssa Cole. This is a classic. This is one that I blanket recommend to people pretty broadly because I think it has a really good mass appeal as a romance book, especially as an entry level romance book. This book features a heroine who is in grad school becoming a scientist and she, I feel like this is one of our early like STEM romances, right? She is getting these emails about how, like scam like emails, right? Like she's like, these aren't real that are like saying that she's betrothed to this African prince. So we all know those scam emails. Uh, so she's getting them, she doesn't believe them, she keeps tossing them to the side. Lo and behold, he shows up to her work and starts to romance her and it's just really fun. It's really a delightful series. The whole series is about reluctant royals. They don't necessarily want to be royals, but they are. And I think it does the royalty trope really, really well, especially as someone who doesn't necessarily love the royalty trope. But this is one of those books, like I said, I recommended this to a lot of people who want to try romance because one, who doesn't know the whole scam email setup? Two, it's such an interesting setup that I think it's really engaging to a reader who maybe doesn't always read romance or is newer to the genre. Next, we have Burn For Me by Alona Andrews. This is a trilogy that this is this actually a series called Hidden Legacy. There are three books in each group of this series following different couples, soon to be. We're waiting on the last couple. But this follows Nevada Baylor, who is a investigator, <laughs> an independent investigator, and she has magical abilities. The whole world has magical abilities. There are families that are considered like the top of the food chain in this world and magical abilities. Their houses are considered like very important. Nevada is hunting down a prime, which is like a very powerful wizard. And she runs into Connor Mad Brogan. He is delightful <laughs> as a hero. This is the old cover I'm putting up, by the way. There is a new cover, but I just love cover. So he is like this billionaire who also helps hunt down people on this job and it is their romance but also a really fantastic urban fantasy situation. We are getting a lot of world building here, a lot of fun magic. This is very much one of those books that like if you're into urban fantasy, if you're into fantasy, like that kind of fantasy book, it could be a really great spot to start. And also they're just, they just have like top tier banter with each other and I love that element in this. This entire series is fantastic. Highly, highly recommend. Next, I have In a Jam by Kate Canterbury. This is a recent favorite for me, but it is a very, it's long, but I think a very accessible contemporary romance because though it is long, it features a high school friends to kind of forgotten to lovers as adults. They enter into a fake marriage because she needs to be married to inherit the farm, which like obviously these are not real life setups. The best part of the fake marriage though is he's like a lawyer or former lawyer. So he knew, would know a way and offers to break, the, like find a way out of the contract. And she's like, no, it's fine. We'll just do it. And then like, lo and behold, we discover that he was like very in love with her in high school. And she's not forgotten him, but doesn't remember everything he remembers from high school, which like fair, that does happen to people. Like, I think some people's critique of this is like, how does she not remember him as much? The chemistry on page in this is fantastic. There's also a kid that is hilarious. Like she runs around and acts like a pirate and cusses this whole bunch. It's top tier contemporary romance. This is one of those ones that I think I've seen more and more of people just raving about and I think it deserves every bit of love it, it, it gets. And I do think it's one that deserves so much attention because it just does it really, really well, especially considering that it is pretty long. And I do have qualms with longer contemporary romances, but this one delivers. Next, I have Morning Glory Milking Farm by CM Nacosta. Okay, so why is this on my list? One, I think this is a formative monster romance. This really did something in the genre. It did something in erotica romances, which are definitely romances that are more sex forward, okay? Like, do know that. But this is kind of an adventure. This is like an exploration of millennial ennui. I feel like I constantly like, struggle trying to pay off debts and or student loans and survive. This original cover I'll throw up here for a moment. I feel like it delivers so much about the story. And I feel like this is the monster romance that kind of went mainstream first-ish. Uh, we've had some others, but this one really hit a lot broader than I would have ever expected for what its content is. But I think it does a really interesting job again exploring, trying to make ends meet, and finding love in the process and milking a minotaur. That's all you need to know. It's a delight. It's a fun time. Next, we have The Rest of the Story by Tal Bauer. This is another contemporary romance. This is a hockey romance. This is an own representation MM romance. 
and I think this one I put here because I sobbed. I sobbed multiple times during this book and I'm not a crier. I am not a crier, but I sobbed. It's okay that I sobbed because at the end of the day, I think this is one of those books that if it's if it works for you, it's going to work really, really well. It's about a soon to be retired hockey player who goes to a team that is kind of the bottom of the barrel, worst of the worst, because his friends are kind of like, we need you to come here. And when he gets there, he sees how badly treated the rookies are being and the veteran players. And he steps in and he starts to fix it. And he, him and one of the rookie, the not quite rookies have like a moment where he's like, oh, I really, I'm very attracted to you. And then it's their slow friendship to lovers development. And there's definitely a lot of content warnings in this book around abuse by coaches, um, sexual abuse, sexual assault, homophobia, and things like that. But on the whole, this story is wonderful. And it shows how you can come through really tough times and still find love, I feel like. And I love that about this book. Me and so many people have loved this story. And I think it's just one of those ones that, again, I just get emotional thinking about them because I love them so much. Then we have a series I love and not everyone loves, but I think is a definitely deserves to be on this list. And I'm just going to blanket put the series on the list. And that is the Immortals After Dark series by Presley Cole. I'm a fan. I am a big fan of this series. This follows various kinds of paranormal beings. And I think it in a lot of ways keys into the essential of to the mid 2000s paranormal romance which is formative to where we are today in paranormal romances and I think it's really fun reading them because when I did my reread and I was reading other paranormals I could see the pieces of these books in other books I've read and I think that can be a really fun experience if you have read a lot of a genre when you can pick up on things in other books that were also popular. This is a massive series, I will say that. I think some great entry points are A Hunger Like No Other, Dark Needs at Night's Edge, and Sweet Ruin. I think any of those could be good entry points for you. It's up to you. You can also listen to a podcast called Faded Mates to read along with it. But I think this whole series does some really interesting work in the paranormal genre. I think, again, the way we hop through various kinds of paranormal beings and have this overarching plot that is building but each book is still a very set concrete romance and the, the overarching plot may not move forward enough for some people but I personally have loved it and I'm very nervous to see where it goes. Next I have a historical romance called The Lotus Palace by Jeannie Lin. This is a Chinese based mystery historical romance. This is one that surprised me immensely. This is another one I think again formative to us getting our like our non-England historicals to where we are today where we do have like a good variety of options. I absolutely love this. I think this took a romance and a mystery element and made it the best thing ever. I do want to note here the heroine is an assault survivor and has a dissociative episode during intimacy with the hero in this one. So do you know that going in? I feel like this is one of those books that brings you through a range of emotion because our heroine is viewed as not one of the most beautiful people in the world, but she works for one of the most beautiful people in the world. She kind of lives in the shadow of her famous mistress, but she meets a and she meets this beautiful man and they end up teaming up together to solve a mystery. It's just one of those books that is like really beautiful at the end of the day, that story being told. It's really touching. It's really fun to see them fall in love with each other while they solve this mystery. It's also really engaging as a read and uh, I just love it and I can't recommend it enough. Okay, next we have Long Shot by Kennedy Ryan. This is another, I think, pivotal contemporary romance. Kennedy Ryan was the first Black author to win a Rita when the RWA was not in shambles. That was huge. This book also, <laughs> tons of content warnings here, deeply centers domestic abuse. So this follows Erwin and our hero who he plays basketball for her current fiance's like partner's rival team. There is lots of domestic violence in this, including gun abuse and all kinds of, I mean, all kinds of things, right? So in this, they are fighting to find a way to be together, kind of. But we also have this third act moment in which she goes away and she has to heal from what she went through because she goes through it and she goes through a lot and you need to know the content warnings going into this. But I feel like this is another one of those stories, like a lot of these that I'm sharing here, that is really beautiful and really centers the idea that everyone and anyone is worthy of love, no matter what you've been through. Because I do feel that when you go through some of those kinds of situations, you feel like you're unworthy and it's a you problem when it's not, it's a them problem. I also sobbed reading this. I don't think I've ever read a Kennedy Ryan book I didn't sob to, but this is one that I think just, again, pivotal moment in romance history, but also pivotal moment in contemporaries on how we depict things and show people being worthy of love no matter what. 
Okay, next we have I Feel A New, a current classic, and that is Ice Planet Barbarians by Ruby Dixon. This series, to me, is the embodiment of the alien romance genre to an extent. This is one of the ones that started gaining big traction and popularity. Now we're getting reprints of them. I mean, it's wild. With those reprints, um, we've, we're getting these really fun covers from Berkeley, and it's a series that I think navigates a like a really big world and also gives us a lot to think about as far as kind of being a cozy alien romance. <laughs> I love this series. We follow these women who end up trapped on Not Hoth, and they are taken in by these giant blue alien men. There is one in which it has what I call Chekhov's dildo, because <laughs> he carves her one and it's never used. You just never know. It's like Chekhov's gun. It's Chekhov's dildo. Yeah, I think this series overall, the way that we go through this, all these romances and then also expand out into a bigger world is like fascinating. I think they're really engaging books. They're also just one of the best popcorn reads in which you could just sit down, read a book, and you're done and you're like oh my gosh I'm done <laughs> I'm here and also I just think they've framed a lot of how and what we talk about in our alien romances sometimes which is also fascinating okay last but not least is Rave by Rebecca Weatherspoon oh my goodness okay so this book another one that like when it came out I was reading it and I remember just watching everyone talk about this book this is a book in a series called Loose Ends this features a buff male nanny who is nannying for a surgeon and her twin daughters he and her end up of course hooking up because that's what happens uh not always but like it's a romance book that's what's gonna happen in this situation and in doing so they develop a really beautiful relationship and he loves her girls and he takes such good care of them and he's so good with the kids and the kids are great on page we also get introduced to a lot of the other characters in the loose ends world which are characters in other books by rebecca that are getting their hea in this series which has been so much fun I really love this series. I think this is just one of those books where I had never read a male nanny before when I read this and I think a lot of us hadn't and that was part of the love for this book. And I think it was really fun to see a man on page doing women's work as we'll call it. I all know that's not the case or isn't like what it really is but that's what's happening on page and seeing him like care for her and make sure she's good and able to do her job. Absolutely fantastic. Such a good book. Highly recommend. All right, those are my 10, so I hope you find one you like. Hi, I'm Stephanie, the Literary Hype Woman of Literary Hype YouTube channel, which is your home for bookish content, author interviews, as well as a lot of pop culture and Comic-Con content. If you look at the New York Times original list, it uh, is a lot of literary fiction and that's not really my jam. I don't really read a lot of literary fiction. I'm sure you're surprised. I read a lot more genre fiction. So I would like to point out some nonfiction and some genre titles that I loved. I'm gonna start out with my nonfiction picks and starting with Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. This is a book on exploring creativity and like really tapping into your creative self and like Elizabeth's journey through that. This is one of the few books I actually take the time to reread every so often. I don't have the time to reread. Like you can see my shelves. There's a lot of books over there that need to be read. But this is one that I do reread because I think it does have a really important message on creativity and fear and how to handle the two together. Another book that I think should have been on the list is Killing Comparison by Nona Jones. She is the head of Faith Partnerships for Facebook. So she sees a lot of what social media does to people. So this book dives into dealing with how we see the world through a comparative lens because of social media and um, I don't think I've ever put so many post-it tabs on a book in my life. These all have different meanings. It's been a while since I've read this book but this is one that I do want to reread at some point because it is so important for our society right now to think about how social media is impacting ourselves and how that leads to us comparing ourselves to others that we probably shouldn't be. I dug this next book out of my safe and that is All the Gallant Men by Donald Stratton. This is the first memoir written by a USS Arizona survivor. And I got to meet him, so this is a signed book. That is why it lives in my safe, because he is no longer with us. His account of the attack on Pearl Harbor is just absolutely stunning. It's very detailed and like talking about like getting out of the water and like his skin coming off like he was taking a sock off of his arm. Like he really paints a picture of what was going on that day. It's hard to read at points and even more so the journey that he took afterward to fight for the person who saved his life, who disobeyed orders and saved his life. So it's a really moving story. I get asked 
quite a bit what my favorite book is and that's always a question that makes me go um uh... but most often if I am answering that question the answer is going to be The Girl You Left Behind by Jojo Moyes. This is about a painting of a girl whose husband goes off to fight in World War I and then the Germans come in and occupy her home while her husband's away and she has this painting that he did of her. So we see that in the beginning of like the Germans are in her house and there's this painting and the Germans are really interested in this painting and then it jumps to modern day and where that painting is now and kind of goes back and forth and like figuring out who owns the painting, where the rights go. I give this book out at blind dates for book parties all the time and everyone's always like, mm, doesn't sound like my jam. And then they call me a couple days later telling me that they're crying and it's all this book's fault. Another historical fiction book that I think should have been on this list that a lot of other people have shouted out that should have been on this list is All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. It is so beautiful. It, just, it makes me want to go to that place in France. Like it's about a blind girl. Her dad makes her this like map of the town so she can like feel the map so she can know where to go and like he's gone and uh, it's a World War II story so I'm sure you know where things are going and I'm not gonna say any further because I don't want to spoil anything but one of my best friends and I were reading this book together when it first came out and we both felt like this is going to be a classic that kids are going to read in school down the line because it is just so well done. I really love a good thriller, especially one that can keep me guessing. If I can figure it out before the halfway point, it's not a good book. And then there is Sharp Objects by Gillian Flynn. She gets a lot of fame for Gone Girl, which is a fabulous book, but this one. This is about a reporter from a small town in Missouri. She's now grown up and in Chicago. She has to go back to her hometown because there's a murder. Well, a missing girl that is suspected to be dead. But she goes back to investigate because it has some similar vibes to something that she went through when she was younger and still living there. There is a TV show based on this and all I'm gonna say is I have never chucked a book before because I thought I was right. Everything set it up as I was right. We get to the end and I'm still thinking I was right and then it flips it on its head in the last literal two pages and I, I literally threw this book from one end of the registers at my store to the other end. And if you've ever been in a Barnes & Noble, you know that most of those register spaces are pretty large. Um, I threw this book quite, quite far. I've also never fangirled so hard in my life as I did when I met Gillian Flynn. You also won't see a lot of YA titles on the New York Times 100 best books of the 21st century list. And there's a lot of different ways I could go with this, but I did want to represent YA in some form or fashion. I feel like a lot of people have been saying The Hunger Games should be on this list, and it should, but I'm going to go a slightly different direction and give a shout out to another book that I think is really, really solid and just does not get the, des the love it deserves, and that is The Atlas of Us by Kristen Dwyer. Um, this is about a teenage girl who goes on a kind of like behavioral hiking trip. Like she's got to do some community service hours so she's going on a hiking trip to rehabilitate this trail while also kind of working on her own attitude is the the mission. And they don't go by real names, they don't give out information about themselves. So it's her journey through this trail in California and you know that there's some things that aren't being said so it's semi not really a spoiler alert it's talked about pretty early on um, but she's lost her dad and this trail is really important to her dad. So she's processing her grief through this trip and like interacting with other teenagers. A really special, especially when you know how much of Kristen's real life translates into this book, this is just a really special exploration of grief from a teenage perspective. So The Atlas of Us by Kristen Twire. The number one genre I read right now is romance and that started during the pandemic so romance is gonna get more of my list than most other genres but I do want to start with Forget Me Not by Julie Soto. I rated this as my number two book of 2023 last year because it is so so good and we'll get to number one in a moment that is coming but forget me not by julie soto this is about a wedding planner who lands a big influencer's wedding the catch is they have already selected their florist and it happens to be someone that she has had issues with in her past as in there was a little bit of a situation ship going on so this has got like every romance trope you can think of in it it is so well done and it's like you don't even think about the, the fact that all these strips in there you've got forced proximity you've got co-workers enemies to lovers you've got second chance like all of these tropes are baked into this story in such a way that doesn't really like 
feel like it's beating you over the head. It is so well done. I forgot that I cooked steak. I was gonna read like for 30 minutes and go to the gym and I finished this book in four hours and forgot that I had cooked. It's that good. I was never really much of a Christmas romance person. That felt too cheesy, too cliche. It was not a Hallmark girly. Uh, and then I read A Merry Little Meat Cute by Julie Murphy and Sierra Simone. This book is hysterical. So it is about a plus size porn star who sort of accidentally gets cast in a Hallmark Christmas-esque movie where it's like super clean, super sweet, keep everything under control. But so she's told, don't let anybody know what you do on the side. But her co-star happens to be one of the guys from the boy band that she was obsessed with and still has a shrine to. Oh, and he's a top subscriber to her porn. Hi, Jinx and Sue. In, in only a way that Julie Murphy and Sierra S Simone can create. Like, it is spicy. It is hilarious. It's just such a joyful book that I am obsessed with the series. So, A Merry Little Me Cute! And my final selection for books that should have been on the New York Times list is The True Love Experiment by Christina Lauren. This was my favorite book of 2023. It's still holding strong as like one of my most favorite books. This is just such a love letter to fandom and fangirls and just joy that it's really hard to not love this book. It is about a romance writer named Fizzy. She is the best friend from The Soulmate Equation, but she gets cast on a reality dating show that is created by a British single dad who's really not into reality TV at all. He's only making this show because he has to. He wants to make documentaries, but he's been told to make a dating show. So he makes this dating show and they cast Fizzy as the lead. And the way that they work in the technology from book one and also writing and tropes and romance and like there's some, some, some boy bands in there. It's just perfection. Christina and Lauren write perfection. I have not read a bad book by them yet. I don't think this one gets as much love as it deserves. Their book, Love in Other Words, gets a lot of love and deservedly so, but I also think this should be up there on that list. Thanks Bethany for including me in this project. Hi friends, I'm going to be sharing some of the books that I think deserve to be on the list of best books of the 21st century. And I'm going to be a little or a lot biased because these are limited to books that I have read and enjoyed and also books that speak to me in a really profound way. Books that have reflected my experience but also shaped my worldview. In no real specific order because like I said, these are 10 of the best books that I think were published between 2000 and now. So the first book on my list is a book that I can't completely describe except to say that The Luminaries by Eleanor Catton is a really mesmerizing book. It is set in the 1800s in New Zealand and we're reading about a man who's an outsider. He enters this town at a period where he has come to find wealth during their version of the gold rush and he meets a circle of men who are discussing an event that has already happened and each person talking about their experience, their perspective of what happened. So we go through the scenes of what is happening both in the present and in the past. There's a lot of astrological significance to how this book is told because we are going through like the phases of the moon, which is, you know, kind of described here on the cover. And as we go through each orbit, we are closing in on the thing that everything is rotating around. So this is a book that I think needs to be read with notes. And so I'll just show you a little bit of the notes that I created when I was reading this book because, yeah, it makes you think of spherical storytelling and a little bit of the spokes of a wheel and then you have to figure out who the hub of that whole story is it's a little complex it's a little complicated but it is so worth it so the luminaries by eleanor catton i think is one of the best books that was written in the 21st century consider this a recommendation to add it to your tbr <laughs> another book that i read some time ago but i have not stopped thinking about ever since i read this one is a tale for the time being by ruth ozeki the author is of japanese buddhist background very very different <laughs> from my own life experience but this book speaks to me in a very intellectual and social way because again we're reading about multiple characters whose lives are 
kind of circling each other, mirroring each other, but not the same. One of the characters in this book is a teenage girl in Japan who is going through some really difficult personal experiences. She's being bullied at school. She feels like an outsider. And so she's decided to perhaps end her life. But before she leaves this world, she wants to write down the story of her life, but also the story of her grandmother's life. And her grandmother is a Zen Buddhist. Sometime later, this diary washes up across the world on the beach in Canada. And it's being read by someone whose life has some similarities to the author, the author of the book, as well as the author of the journal. But while she is reading this girl's journal that was written sometime in the past, it is impacting her present life. And she can't skip ahead she has to live out what is happening in the journal. What I really, really loved about this book is the intellectual thought process that the book takes you on. There are a lot of scientific and literary references that are included in this book. So I am not like now, who is the Japanese girl. I'm not like Ruth, who is the older woman who finds the journal. But there is a universality of experiences, no matter where you are. Kind of the plight of being an outsider, the plight of wanting to fit in, to belong. So if you haven't already heard about A Tale for the Time being by Ruth Ozeki, or if you haven't read it, also add this one. This is a little bit of a cheat because White Teeth by Zadie Smith was published in 2000. Not completely the 21st century, but why not? The two main seeming characters in this book are two people who seem unlikely to become friends but their destinies are so intertwined two people of very different racial backgrounds and they become friends their their wives become friends and the lives of their children are also intricately woven in in places and ways that they don't necessarily orchestrate and then there are also places where they're trying to put their their families together and it's not working because of all the outside all the external influences in this book zadie smith weaves a tale about the melting pot of experiences when people emigrate from their various backgrounds and sometimes they are thrown together other times they choose to be with each other and what it's like when you are in this community that absorbs you but you have this desire to be someplace else whether it is a desire to return to the place where you are from or <laughs> as is the case in a lot of immigrant backgrounds where you want to send your children after you've come to this new home this new world and you've made the life that you want how you kind of romanticize sending your children back to your ancestral grounds to get the same upbringing that you did and what that's like. So I love how the author weaves in a lot of that immigrant desire, whether it is the desire to initially leave home or the desire to send your children back to where you have come from. I love how that is expressed in here and it is hilarious at points. What Storm, What Thunder by Miriam J. H. Chansey records the experiences of people in Haiti during the earthquake that devastated the country in 2010. And in this book, she traces the experiences of I think seven individuals who are just going about their business when the earthquake occurs. And she traces the experiences during that time as well as the aftermath and shows how these various people, some of them who did not know each other before, how their lives are linked both in the present and in the future. This is a fascinating read. It is immersive, it's gripping, it's sad, it's hopeful in some places. Really, really love this book and definitely want to recommend What Storm, What Thunder by Miriam J. H. Chansey as well. The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers is another big book. The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois traces a little bit of the social socioeconomic path that African Americans have taken in this country. So we're reading about a modern family and the desire of the children to trace the paths that their parents have taken, whether physically or just through storytelling. And what information do we withhold from our children when we tell them the stories of our lives or the stories of our families? What are some of the family secrets that erode the family experience just because we don't talk about it? And by not exposing those skeletons in the family's closet, how are we hurting the members of the family? So the author explores a lot of the hurt and pain that African Americans have faced in their history. But she's also very tender in her presentation of the love and beauty that exists in this storyline. So really, really love this book and I hope you will too. Home Going by Yeah Jessie is one of the first books that I read that 
shone a light on the possibilities that existed for people of African background during the period of enslavement. So in this book, we explore the lives of two sisters, one who was captured and enslaved in the United States and one who remained on the African continent and lived out her life and had her family there. And how these two branches of the family, even as they were forced apart, how they came back together. The Island of Forgetting by Jasmine Seeley is another Caribbean book that I highly, highly recommend. Jasmine Seeley does something brilliant in this book in that she takes elements of Greek mythology and completely adapts it for our time and our space. It's almost a retelling of Greek mythology, but using Caribbean characters, using Caribbean setting, and showing how a lot of those characters, how their lives were interwoven. This book is brilliant in its concept. It's also brilliant brilliant in its execution. If you're interested in the classics and in modern retellings of classic stories, then you will completely love The Island of Forgetting by Jasmine Seeley as well. Cast by Isabel Wilkerson is one of the best books to ever have been written, not just limited to the 21st century. It's sad that the book ever needed to have been written because it describes a lot of the systematic racism that African Americans have faced and continue to face. Despite the improvements in our modern society, where are the places that prejudice and bias still persist and will continue to persist if there aren't changes to the actual system, not just individual thought? I recommend this book with a caveat because if you're not ready to be completely aware of what the world is like, if you want to live with blinders on, then this book might be uncomfortable to read. But this is probably one of the most stirring books that I have ever read. So completely recommend it to you because I want everybody to be alert and aware of what is happening in our country and in our world. Read Cast by Isabel Wilkerson if you're ready to be there as well. I'm also adding to my list Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. This book was brilliant in its presentation, again, of the diversity of experiences for young people growing up in a society where they are socialized to want more from their lives, to want more than what their parents have, regardless of their parents' success in their homeland. A lot of us as young people are encouraged to look elsewhere, to look for scholarship, to look for opportunities in other countries. So in Americana, the author presents two young adults who are on the brink of a romantic relationship, but their paths push them to two different countries, one to the United States and one to England. And she shares a little bit of what the experience of someone who is from Africa coming into the United States and is now seen in some circles as African-American and in other places not and compares that to the experience of someone who immigrates to another country. And of course, like with the stories of a lot of immigrants, the push to return to their homeland at some point in their, in their journey. So I love this presentation of the diversity and the similarities between people who leave their countries no matter where they go. To round out my list, I'm going to be recommending How to Say Babylon by Sophia Sinclair. The author is from Jamaica. She grew up in a very strict Rastafarian household. And so in this book, she presents her experience, what it was like to grow up with a Rastafarian father and mother, but she also shares a little bit of the history that created the Rastafarian movement in, the, in Jamaica in the early 1900s, the social conditions that had Black activists encouraging their followers to look to Africa, look to the motherland for spiritual guidance and for representation, but also this push to experience personal connection with God and moving away from establishment, moving away from the established government and established religion, and looking to create their own expression of religion and what that looked like. So this was enlightening because even for me growing up in Jamaica, there was a lot that I did not know about Rastafarian culture and the birth of Rastafarianism, and it was presented in this book. So definitely want to recommend it because there's a lot to learn from this book. And of course, the author's presentation is authentic and very, very immersive. So definitely want to recommend How to Say Babylon by Sophia Sinclair. So those are 10 of the best books that I think have been published in the 21st century. Let me know what your 10 books would be. Well, it is a wild book garden, and here are my submissions. These are in absolutely no order. Order. Number one on my list is Gulfstruck Island by Frances Harding. We follow our main character, Hathen, who is very underestimated by people. She's very ordinary because her sister is one of the lost, who are these people who are born with this ability to send out their senses. 
but one day all of the other lost on this island or in this community are mysteriously killed so happen ends up kind of being thrust into the role of the main character uh, to try and figure out what happened and it also seems to be tied to some culture clashes that have historically happened on this island between Hathen's people who are the indigenous population and the you know foreign powers the colonizers who came in more recently this book deals with things like prejudice and stereotypes and what evil looks like, the idea of responsibility and atonement. I also love the world building here and the culture and the history that Frances Hardy creates. It feels so rich and real. Number two is one of two, what I feel like are kind of basic bitch answers for this list. And that is the book Thief by Marcus Zusak. It is very famously narrated from the point of view of death. And I feel like the way that Marcus Zusak characterizes death and uses him as the narrator for a World War II story in this way. The point of view choice and the writing style that was very poetic, it had a lot of metaphors, but not in a way that felt distracting. I think it would have been easy for that to kind of overshadow what the story is about, but in my opinion it didn't, and it was emotionally effective without being manipulative, which I think is very impressive for a story of this kind. Number three is Sherwood by Megan Spooner. This is a retelling of Robin Hood, and Robin actually dies in the prologue of this book. And so Marion is the main character of this story, and she decides to sort of take up the mantle as Robin Hood. And this is such a beautiful and quiet story. It is very character focused. It also deals a lot with grief, and specifically the kind of grief where there is like guilt there. The entire cast of this book is so well written, and even the characters that you don't see on page very often, they still feel like fully developed people, and that we're just not seeing all of their story. This book also, it has an example of what I like to call retroactive character development uh, for one of the important supporting characters, and that is a strategy that I think is very difficult to get right, but when it is done well, I love it so much. It impresses me so much. I also love thematically the different things that this book handles in a way that is so subtle and just, just part of the characters and their story. I also love that this book is explicitly against the not like other girls trope. This book is also a reminder that just because a female character makes a choice that you don't like, it doesn't make a book anti-feminist. I actually think this is one of the strongest feminist books that I have read. Number four is Ray Bear by Jordan Fuego. They do the things that other extremely popular fantasy authors think they do, in my opinion. The amount of world building and character development and like thematic discussion while still creating a really engaging story. These different relationships and like the setting in the world, like all of this, the things that she does, the way that she blends all of those together, I think is incredibly talented. And I think it's something that not everybody can do so successfully. The things that this duology says about colonialism and about responsibility and the ways to do good in the world. These discussions are, I think, very thoughtful and nuanced and are like heightened by how rich and developed this world and characters are. This book is divided into, I think, three or four different parts. It is a complete narrative. It feels cohesive, but each part also has a very distinct flavor. And every time we would get to the change, like we would get into the next part, I would be like, oh no, but I was I was really invested in this thing. I don't know if I'm gonna like this other part as much. And every single time, Jordan Fuego won me over very quickly. Number five is The Sword of Kaiken by M.L. Wong, a fantasy novel that is partly inspired by some aspects of feudal Japan um, and that history, but there's also more modern elements. We're following two main characters primarily, Misaki and one of her sons, Mamoru. Misaki is expected to be a good housewife, a good mom. She's expected to not ever talk about her past, which is that she is an incredibly well-trained fighter, but she ends up having to do that when some conflicts start happening in their homeland. And it seems to be conflicting with some things that their government is telling them, and Mamoru is actually slowly starting to realize that maybe some things that he has grown up being taught are not actually true and are not actually the way that the world is. Even though there is so much interesting plot and like politics and like fight scenes and everything, the characters are so well developed and their arcs are taken 
so like seriously, they're done so well. This also is another example of retroactive character development for one of the important supporting characters. I also love the way that this book really pushes back against gender stereotypes, like especially in the character of Masaki. Number six is Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bully. This took the internet, the reading world by storm when it came out a few years ago and for very good reason. It's also one of those books that people, some reviewers like to compliment by saying like, I can't believe it's YA, it's so good, which is a backhanded compliment if I've ever heard one, but the book is incredible. It is a thriller and a contemporary, and it also is very heavily based in the author's Ojibwe culture and heritage, and our main character is biracial, she is white and Ojibwe. The emphasis in this book on community and on different kinds of family and love and friendship I think is really beautiful, and it helps balance out the pretty dark things that are happening. The mystery element I found extremely compelling. I would need to read just a few pages or a couple chapters and I would read like several hundred pages at once. Number seven is Little Thieves by Margaret Owen. So our main character Vanya, she's able to magically disguise herself and um, she's been using that to steal from unpleasant rich people to try and get enough money to escape, to run away. But one day she accidentally steals from the wrong person and she gets cursed by one of their kingdom's gods or spirits and she is going to be cursed to turn slowly to gemstone if she doesn't do what this being wants. The young woman that she is posing as is engaged to this absolutely despicable like prince or person who is coming home very soon and so Vanya is very worried that she is going to be expected to go through this marriage to this awful person and then on top of all of that and a very young very naive seeming inspector shows up to try and figure out why these jewels are going missing. I love Vanya. She's a character type that I feel like a lot of authors do but doesn't often work for me. We see that her selfishness is self-preservation, that she has grown up knowing that she doesn't have anybody to look out for her and she has to do it for herself. And seeing her slowly realize that not everybody is like that, that there are going to be people who care about her is so beautiful and so heartwarming. All of the relationships in this book I think were really complex, really well done. There is a romance that is one of my all-time favorites. I think it is so good. Margaret Owen has this perfect sense of when to use like a more beautiful and atmospheric passage, especially in the short sections that are sort of mimicking a folktale, or when to focus more on like character and like humor. Number eight is Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. This is a gothic horror novel following our main character Noemi. Her cousin has just sent her a letter saying that she's afraid and that she thinks her new husband is trying to kill her and that she needs help. So Noemi shows up and things immediately get even creepier than she thought originally. I don't read a lot of horror, but this is a fantastic book. It is so smart in the way that it uses horror and like frightening things and horror tropes to comment on like real world kind of horror. Like the way that this book attacks eugenics and misogyny and colonialism and xenophobia and colorism is just so incredibly smart while also being a really compelling and creepy and atmospheric book. Number nine is the other sort of basic answer on this list, and this Bear Town by Frederick Backman, which is translated from the Swedish by Neil Smith. This is a contemporary that deals very heavily with sexual assault and rape culture. Bear Town is a very small town, and they're really struggling. One of the only things they have going for them is their fantastic hockey team, and if they can continue to succeed with that, it'll really put them on the map. And then one of their star hockey players does something absolutely atrocious and horrible and it's about how the community reacts to that, which side they end up taking and why. I feel like the way that this book combines these many different characters and many different sort of plot threads that all end up kind of coming together for a couple of main storylines, I think that was really well done. I think there's a lot of ways that it could have become disjointed or confusing, but it didn't feel that way to me. And all of these characters, the ones that you love, the ones that you hate, they all feel incredibly real. And that is one of the, I think, heartbreaking and effective things about this book. I think it really highlights how there are no small examples of sexual harassment or violence or rape culture or misogyny. It all is the same problem. Finally, number 10 is I think the most recent read on this list, and that is What Happened to Rachel Riley by Claire Swinarski. This is a contemporary book that is middle grade, so it is intended for a younger audience. And this is also a book that deals with rape culture and that kind of normalized violence, and especially in very small but building ways. I think it's handled in a way that is suitable for the intended age of reading this book, but also I think that it handles it with incredible depth and nuance, and adult readers or older readers could also 
get a lot out of it and appreciate the storytelling. Our main character is this young girl who I think her family has just moved into a new town, so she's starting at a new school, trying to get to know people and fit in, and she realizes that there's this one girl, Rachel Riley, who nobody talks to. It's like she doesn't exist. Nobody wants to tell her what happened to Rachel Riley. I think it is so important that we have stories like this and again like all of the books I've talked about I think that this book does a lot of heavy lifting thematically uh, with its messaging and with the way that it so compassionately and thoughtfully deals with these difficult topics in a way that is appropriate but also it's a really good book it is really engaging to read and I also feel the writing style and like the first person narration I think her voice and her personality is so vivid the author shows the way that from a very young age we normalize girls to accept things that are unacceptable. Okay, so those were the 10 books that I am submitting. Thank you again, Bethany, for including me, and I can't wait to see everybody's list. Hi friends, I'm Jess from the Hex Library, and I have been tasked with giving you 10 best books from the 21st century. This list is not my favorite books, what I consider to be the best books. Those are two different things. They'll be in order by author's last name alphabetically. I basically decided to go with books that I feel like either taught me something about myself or taught me something about the world at large. The first is a newer release that I actually don't have a physical copy of yet and that is Looking for Smoke by K.A. Coble. This is a YA mystery thriller that focuses on the missing and murdered indigenous women and the Two Feather Project and it is set on a Blackfeet reservation. It follows our main character Mara who is newer to the reservation and is only half Blackfeet so she feels like she doesn't necessarily belong within this group of people and it also follows four other people Sam, Lauren, Brock, and Eli. It follows them through figuring out about the missing person case of Lauren's older sister and also the death of a member of that group of five. I won't tell you which because it should be a surprise. It is really a story about betrayal and learning who you can trust and how you can trust but also about teaching us as the reader about the Blackfeet community as well as about the missing and murdered indigenous women and also the Two Feather Project. This is a debut that does remarkable work at transporting you into this location. It does the heavy lifting and really puts you in where you feel like you are a part of this community and walks you through everything. It shows statistics of the disproportionate ways of the number of indigenous women go missing in the US and Canada versus people who look like myself and how the media puts a lot more attention onto people who look like myself than those who do not. Beautiful story. Absolutely loved it. Next we have House of Leaves by Mark C. Danielewski. This is a case of not my favorite books because I think I ended up giving this a three star but it is a fantastically done book if you get what I'm saying. If you don't know what House of Leaves is about, it's a book within a book within a book. It's actually a transcript in a book within a set of notes within a book within a book. There are passages that are written backwards. There are pages that have words upside down or only one word on the page. Follows a transcript of a family that moved into this house that was bigger on the inside than it was on the outside and they find a doorway that leads into this maze inside the house and there's just a whole lot going on to this book. The writing craft that went into this is why I consider it a best book because it really did something that I have never seen done before or since. A lot of people compare books to House of Leaves but nothing has really hit the House of Leaves benchmark for me. I did not love this but it was done so well and I'm absolutely jealous of this person's ability to write because just the way that all this was put together fantastically done. I don't think anything like this will probably ever exist again. This was fantastic on a pure experience level. Next we have a book that if I did not put it on this list you would all think that I was lying to you and that is Truth Witch by Susan Zinnard. This is where I throw in the caveat of there are a lot of authors that I like multiple books from or I think are best books in the series. I don't necessarily think this is the best book of the series but it is the first book of the series and therefore is a series 
series as a whole. I think it's a best book. We'll talk about it more when we get to some other things on this list. It's fine. This series follows four main characters, Safi, Azult, Merrick, and Aidwan, and it's set in a world where there are different types of witches. Our main character, Safi, is a truth witch. It is deals with a lot of political intrigue, a lot of family dynamics, and drama, and world building, and it is just this fantastic time of like learning about this culture and different cultures and the way that the religion plays into the wars and also the royalty and friendship and love and all of those things. And if you are into those things, you'll probably enjoy this book. Next is basically the entire Percyverse by Rick Riordan. This is the first book of the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series. Maybe not the best book of the Percyverse, but this universe overall. One thing that Rick does really well, especially in later series, not necessarily so much in this book, but later series especially, he does do a really good job of bringing in different cultures, different religions, different races, different types of people, different gender norms into a middle grade audience. And not a lot when he started doing this in the early 2000s was that really happening at a way that was accessible to a lot of readers. This series deals with Greek and Roman gods and mythology. Other parts of the Percyverse deal with Egyptian and Norse mythology as well. So there's a lot of different things in this universe and I think this is the book that started it all. This launched the ship that set sail on a beautiful universe. Next we have Delicious Monsters by Lizelle Sanbury. This follows two main characters, Daisy who can see ghosts and is in the past, Brittany who is a videographer who does research on hauntings and is in present day which is about a decade after Daisy's time. Daisy moves to her mother's old family home and is basically told to stay out of the house because there's ghosts in there and there's weird stuff going on. This book deals very heavily with the way that media portrays missing black girls versus, again, people who look like me. As we go through the book, we're learning both about Daisy's experience going into the house that she's not supposed to go into, but also Brittany's past and what she thinks is her trying to bring this story to light. And at some point she has to decide what story is more important, the story of herself and her past or the story that she's trying to bring to light of this missing young black girl from the past. Next we have Elantris by Brandon Sanderson. This was my favorite book of 2023. I loved the way that this wove together high fantasy in a readable way that didn't make me feel like I was trying to hold my eyes open with toothpicks learning about different worlds because I feel like that's a lot of the times with high fantasy, adult fantasy, it makes me want to gouge my eyeballs out because they spend six pages describing the texture of paper and I don't really think anybody cares that much. And if they do, maybe they shouldn't. I love the way that this story is put together. I love the characters. I love the world building. And I love that this is part of a bigger world. Again, that's kind of a theme that you'll see in some of these. I love that there's a bigger world that's put into this. And a lot of times that's what makes a best book a best book because it's just this tiny piece of a bigger plot. And I love that. This is where we go into territory of probably is my favorite and not a best book. And if you have ever met me before, you know that it's going to be a semi-definitive list of Worst Nightmares by Crystal Sutherland. This is my favorite book of all time. And as I said, I was trying to pick books that I felt like taught me something about myself. And I discovered this book when I was dealing with a depression and anxiety diagnosis. Our main character, Esther, deals with anxiety very heavily. Her family, she feels like, has been cursed by the Grim Reaper. And basically her brother is depressed and afraid of the dark. Her mother is afraid of bad luck. Her father is an agoraphobe who won't come out of the basement. The story follows Esther and her brother Eugene and their story of how they have to really take a look introspectively about their family. And is it bad luck or is it bad genes? Like do they have mental illness or is the Grim Reaper really cursing them with something? And Esther spends time with her crush Jonah and they have her semi-definitive list of worst nightmares that they go through one by one and kind of defeat these things that could be the great fear of Esther's life that will kill her eventually. That will kill her. It's just a fun story of not fun. There, it's not fun. It's very dark. I always say this is a fun book and like talk about how much fun I have reading it and forget to mention that it is incredibly dark but also very heartwarming and really deals with friendship and family and love and how mental illness is perceived in society and it's just a fantastic book on that aspect. Next we have Other Words for Home by Jasmine Warga. This is written 
in verse and it follows Jude who was born in Syria. Her, her mother, her father, her older brother live in basically a war zone. Her brother decides to fight for the rebels in Syria. Her mother is pregnant and because of that and the dangerous situation that they're in, her father decides to send Jude and her mother to their family in the U.S. in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is very close to where I live. So Jude has to learn about a new culture, a new language, a new society, and how she, as a young woman who does want to wear her hijab and about how she's, you know, not great with the language. She knows some of it, but she's not great with it. And she has these culture norms that she's so used to and ingrained in her mind and having to assimilate into American society and how that affects her. And because we're getting a lot of this from Jude's point of view and from seeing her interactions with her mother and her mother's family, because it's her mother's brother that they move in with and his wife and his daughter, who is Jude's age. You get to see a lot of like what the um, Syrian refugees really have to go through, not just while they're in Syria, but also as they become refugees and knowing that Jude knows that not everyone gets the opportunities that she has to leave like she was able to. This has one of my favorite quotes of all time and it is, hoping is the bravest thing that a person can do. This one really hit me in my feels and it was a fantastic time. Back to books that talk, taught me about me, The Bookish Life of Nina Hill by Abby Waxman. This is a romance but it deals with Nina who she never knew who her father was and she finds out that her father is this fairly well-known guy who has multiple children over multiple different families and multiple generations and she's the only one who never really knew who he was. The rest of them all know each other and so she's meeting her family for the first time and learning that like she's very introverted and very much is just like I don't give a crap about any of this but she has a couple of members of the family who are trying to pull her in and are like you know family is important. What really stuck out for me in this book because Nina does get a letter from her father and she's learning about the way her father was a father to different generations of his children because he had kids you know in his 20s in his 40s in his 60s and he was a different person to all of them. That really sat with me as someone who has a strained relationship with their father and knowing that like he was definitely a different kind of father when I was six versus when I was 16 versus when I was 26 versus when I was 36. Learning about how people are not stagnant. They change over time. Just because you know a person to be one way doesn't mean that's the only way that they are to other people. It was a very interesting way to look at things. I love that. And the last book on this list and Good Lord, how am I gonna edit this down? The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. It is a fictional story based on a non-fictional location. It is set at a juvenile reformatory where boys who broke the law were sent to. At this location, there is a separate housing for the whites and the non-whites. It shows that they're all treated poorly, but especially how poorly the black and Hispanic kids are treated and just the atrocities that are going on in this location and how they are not only unfairly treated, but they're unfairly judged, they're unfairly sent there. There are cemeteries on these reformatory locations that where there are plots of bodies that are not marked because these families were just told that their kids ran away even though they were killed on site and it just really goes into like the history of the unfairness of the justice system in America particularly to black men and boys. I learned a lot and I think it was very well done and as I said that was kind of the guidelines of me picking the top 10 books of this century. Hey there my name is Chantal. You can find me here on YouTube at Chantal Reads, on Instagram at Chantal.Reads and I'm also on Goodreads um, basically slash Chantal. I typically read in the speculative genres so sci-fi fantasy are my hugest uh, favorite genres. I also like horror, general speculative stuff, but I also dip into other genres as long as the book catches my fancy I'll check it out which is where I ended up with a top 10 in this New York Times best books list. I do have a top 10. I've read enough that uh, you know I was surprised that I had that many books. But and one of my favorite books of all time is on this list. So without much ado, let's get started. Going from basically 10 to 1, you know, least favorite of my favorites of this list. We'll start at number 10. This is Persepolis by Marjane Satrapi. Now this is a really great example of how the graphic novel format can really be used well 
to tell a story, to tell a memoir. This is a fantastic memoir. It's evocative, it's emotional. The art is very simple, black and white, but it's really effective in its simplicity because the simplicity really just complements the kind of intensity that the story can have in some moments. And it's just really great. And I think it's a really great example of what the graphic novel format can do. It, it's so effective at what it does and I can see why it's on this list and I'm very happy that it's on this list. My ninth favorite on this list is Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. This is a family saga, an epic family saga. Using the family drama was a really fantastic way of exploring Korean and Japanese cultures and how they clashed, especially in this like um, 20th century time frame that this book covers. And it was such an interesting way to get a whole lot of socio-political, economic, cultural information and framework in using these amazingly well-written characters to tell this story and understand all of this outside that's happening to inform this family drama. So Pachinko by Min Jin Lee, really fantastic, really great. Just check it out. Next to eighth for me is Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. This is a sci uh, light sci-fi, literary sci-fi kind of dystopian tale. And I think the strength of this is really in the character work. Ishiguro is doing a lot of world building, mainly through the very focused uh, lens of these characters. I think it works really well to tell a very cohesive story Maybe not so cohesive at times, but just the emotional depths of the characters and the world around them and that ending I think works really well and that ending stuck with me for a very long time. So I think really that is where like my love for this goes because all of that is leading up to this ending that is just poignant and emotional and really had a huge impact on me. So really like this one. Very much highly recommended. Next is The Road by Cormac McCarthy. This has the dubious distinction of being probably the best post-apocalyptic book I've ever read and the one that I never ever want to read again. McCarthy, his books are very, they require a lot of attention from you and through that attention it just, it really hits you. And a lot of what McCarthy was exploring in this book, he was exploring a lot of human dynamics against the backdrop of some really really terrible stuff in this apocalyptic world and it worked very emotional there is a scene that is like burned into my memory that i actually when the movie came out i didn't want to watch the movie because i didn't want to see that scene with my eyeballs but just very very hard piece of work to read but i think it was very rewarding and really great for the post-apocalyptic canon. It, it rewards you for reading closely and it's just really fantastic. Next is Atonement by Ian McEwan and I don't know what to say about this other than heartbreak. <laughs> it's really fantastic story. It has the high highs of the romance and the low lows of the tragedy and it just it works from start to finish. It's evocative, it's interesting, really makes you love and hate characters, just it has the gamut. It's just really fantastic. Next is Trust by Hernan Diaz. This is such an interesting novel. It plays with storytelling in a way where each section of the book, I think it's about five sections, kind of are in conversation with each other. They play with each other and also against each other. It's such a strong showing. It's such a fun way to play with how to tell a story and how to tell different stories and interweaving, interlocking, changing your perception of what you've read before. It's fantastic all around. Really highly recommended. Next is The Vegetarian by Hong Kong. This is translated from Korean and this is probably one of the strangest books I've ever read that made me think the most. On the surface this is a book about a woman who takes on veganism as a way to kind of claw back control in her life from you know the overly controlling men and society. At the start that's basically what it is. It seems simple but you know the book moves on and things just start to kind of go a little unhinged and just play a lot with metaphor and and stuff like that to really try to say have it has a very specific kind of story and moral that it's telling the themes it's working with just all insane <laughs> but it just made me think so hard it made me like really want to unpack and pick at every single thing that was going on so highly recommended highly warned for uh, content warning if that's something that's important to you really look up content warnings but just so so good i really enjoyed this one next is the fifth season by nk jemison this is a fantastic blend of sci-fi and fantasy 
really strong world building, strong character building. And this book is the reason why I will champion second per person perspective. I'm very glad this is on the list, very glad this is pretty high up on the list and definitely recommended. It is a little hard if you're not really a sci-fi fantasy reader, but it's just, it's well worth it. I think the reward that you get at the end of this book is just so worth it and the rest of the series is fantastic as well. Second favorite of this list is Evicted by Matthew Desmond. Matthew Desmond's strength in this narrative nonfiction is to really shine a light on it and make you see what he's talking about. It's one thing to know when we kind of like put out a reminder, forget it, but he makes you see and you can't unsee after that. You can't not think about the fullness of eviction and poverty and how it's a vicious cycle. And by the end of this book, and I was just like, eat the rich. Just gotta eat the rich, that's all. But yeah, this is absolutely top tier narrative nonfiction. I guarantee that you will learn something new. I guarantee that you will feel more than you ever have about eviction and poverty. Absolutely fantastic, like unforgettable work of nonfiction. Finally, my absolute all time favorite book, number one of this top 10, but also it just happens to be my favorite book of all time is Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell. Very strange, very, another one playing really interestingly with storytelling and how to, you know, breaking down storytelling and coming up with something new and a way to tell a story. And yes, I just, I really, really love this one. Sci-fi, fantasy, dystopia, literary, it's got it all. This book is just, I have an emotional attachment to this book. It got me through some rough spots when I was younger. It's a lot of the thematic work that he's doing here. A lot of the philosoph philosophical work that he's doing here has kind of informed how I approach the world, you know? So there's this quote, it comes from the movie, like the specific quote comes from the movie, but the idea comes from the book. So that is, our lives are not our own. We are bound to others, past and present. And by each crime and every kindness, we birth our futures. That it just, that's, uh, that's how I approach life. Like the way you go through the world is the way the world is going to go through you. There's a whole world out there. There's other people out there who have their own lives and we just need to treat each other with kindness and just think about the fact that our lives affect others and others affect us. So um, I really love this book. I really truly love this book and that is why it is my number one all-time favorite book but also the number one book out of my top 10 on this New York Times list. So thank you, Bethany, for asking me to be a part of this. And I really hope that most of my books are also favorites of others, especially the fifth season, but also Cloud Atlas. Um, again, you can find me on YouTube at Chantal Reitz, and I hope that I will see you all soon. Thank you. Hi, I'm Heather from HEA Bucktubes or HEA Bucktubes, and my channel primarily focuses on diverse indie romances, but I do read a range of things. These are 10 that I selected from my five stars on Goodreads. They're not necessarily in particular order, but my number one is my number one. First one is Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation by Kristen Coves and Dumez. This is a nonfiction book about the white evangelical church, Christian nationalism, Zionism, the history that they played in politics in the United States. As someone who grew up evangelical, grew up all of those things, this is a very fascinating look look at my religious culture and social culture. I was a pastor's kid, I was homeschooled, and uh, from a viewpoint and telling a history that I knew nothing about, and as someone who has kind of deconstructed and has gone through several steps in a anti-racism, anti-Zionism, progressive <laughs> journey, this book taught me things about the way I grew up that I had no idea about. I think if you have a similar background to me, you would find this book so enlightening. Because I am a romance reader and I feel that romance is valid. I had to include some romance on here. So Roleplay by Kathy Yardley is a standalone romance about characters in their 50s who are introverts. This is a love letter to introverts. It is about being queer and finding out your queer identity later in life and that it's okay to be an introvert. It's okay to have whatever personality type you have and to not let people treat you any type of way just because you're different than they are. And it is also just 
so heartwarming in the sense that you realize that your identity is not weird and you're not alone and there's actually words for it and other people experience the same thing and it's just a part of human experience that you didn't realize you weren't alone in. Then I have The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches by Sangu Mandana. The writing in this is delightful. The writing is what stands out. The characters and the plot are excellent but the writing is going to be the thing that makes this a favorite for you. This is about a witch in our world where witches are of course kept secret because society does not treat them well when they find out about them. It's got enemies to lovers and found family and is truly just delightful in every sense of the word. Next I have Wildfire by Alona Andrews. This is the third book in a urban fantasy series that is interconnected trilogies. So this is the end of the first trilogy. And Alona Andrews writes urban fantasy, found family, magic, fight scenes, characters, plot, romance in a way that no one else does. I truly think they're the best of the best in their genre. And if you have not, picked up in Alona Andrews yet, I highly recommend starting with the Hidden Legacy series. It's truly one of the best you're ever going to read. Then I have The Fifth Season, which is the first in the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. This is one that I think is such a fantastic series, but is not my favorite. It is brutal. You start off with child death and child endangerment and that continues throughout. It's really a series about mother's love at the end of the world and you follow multiple different POVs and just doing the best you can in an abusive environment, doing the best you can in a society that wants you dead if you step out of line. Because it is so brutal, I don't love sad, dark, <laughs> things. So it's not a favorite for me, but it is truly excellent. The entire trilogy is excellent. Then I have Paladin's Faith, which is the fourth book in the Saint of Steel series by T. Kingfisher. This is fantasy romance series of interconnected standalones. So you have an overarching plot, but each book is about a different couple. This is again, middle-aged characters in fantasy romance, which you don't get a lot of. It's funny. It's clever. It's sweet. I tend to avoid religious trauma in book C, the first book on this list, but this explores faith and religion and their god literally died and no one knew that a god could die. What do you do when that happens? What do you do when your entire faith is shaken? What do you do when you've been abandoned by the deity that you put your faith in. Then I have The Liar's Knot, which is the second book in a completed trilogy called The Work in the Rose by M.A. Carrick. This is a author duo. This is political fantasy with clever characters. These characters are the smartest in the room and they're going up against each other. And you have a con woman who is trying to work her way into the nobility. You have masked vigilantes. This is Six of Crows growing up. This is the Queen's Thief series growing up. If you like characters who are going to pull one over on the other characters, then this is the series for you. It's dense. It's not a fantasy series that you can read without paying a lot of attention to and you need to have a lot of spoons in order to do so, but it is so underappreciated. It is isn't even funny. <laughs> Next is The King of Atolia, which is the third book in the Queen's Thief series by Megan Whalen Turner. I'm currently doing a read along for this series on my channel. This is my all time favorite series. It is political fantasy that is young adult, but is one that easily works for adults as well. I think that it's age appropriate for teenagers and is written on their level, but not in a way that you as the adult reader would feel like it is too young for you. It is a series that upon reread is so much better than it was even the first time because there's so much of this series that is spoilers and you can't talk about. But it is really anti-colonization. It has a lot of disabled characters in it. And again, you have characters who are the smartest in the room going against each other. Then I have another nonfiction, and that is The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, The Japanese Art of Decluttering and Organizing by Marie Kondo. I read this book when it was already really popular, but long before all the TV shows and all the think pieces and all the blog posts. This has become part of our culture, but have you read the book? Because I think people like to make fun of the process, but when I read the book, it truly helped my mindset in a way that I will carry with me through the rest of my life because it gave me permission to get rid of things that I was struggling to get rid of. And in a consumerist society, I really truly think that this book is life-changing. Even if you don't do the whole process, I think just reading the book really helps your mindset 
in ways that you might not realize it needs help. And lastly, my number one book <laughs> published since 2000 is The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. Obviously, this is the first in the Hunger Games trilogy. This is a genre-defining book. It is one that raised generation. It is one that truly changed the game, in my opinion. Like, there is before the Hunger Games and there is after when it comes to publishing. This stands up so well to the test of time. If you reread it or if you read it for the first time right now, it will be fantastic. It lives up to the hype. It is not one that I think you're going to pick up and be disappointed or feel like, I can't believe that this is the book I've heard so much about. It is everything that it claims to be and more. <laughs> is obviously a dystopian YA. So that's it. Those are my top 10 books of the century. Thank you so much. Bye. Hello everyone. I am Books with Brandy Shanae and I mostly read, well, I read diversely. I read a tons of books regarding contemporary, fantasy, uh, thrillers, mysteries, what have you. Um, and so today I'm here to share with you my top 10 books of the 21st century that are near and dear to my heart. So the first book that I really love to the point where I have multiple editions of this particular book um, and that is going to be The Swords of Kaigen. This is a Theonite war story by M.L. Wong. Love this book to death. As you can see I tabbed it up. I had written in it. I have notes in it because I really enjoyed this book. This is a fantasy and I tell you it takes you on a wild ride and on a wild journey and it's pretty much you're rooting for this one particular character in this book. So I love this book so so much and once again it is near and dear to my heart and I feel like everyone should get a chance to read this. Now for this next one I I get very emotional <laughs> because it had me on an emo uh, like an emotional roller coaster ride and um I this this book is also near and dear to my heart and I love it so much and I don't hear people talking about it enough and that is The Love Songs of W of W.E.B. Du Bois. This is by Honoré uh, Fanon Jeffers love this book so much. We're following a, a family of different generations and it goes on about certain traumas, you know, family issues and family dynamics that are that are issues that are still common in the Black community especially. It goes on from the very beginning of slavery into the current day and age. And so once again this book is very near to my my heart. It takes you it's it really takes you on a journey and it makes you think about your own family and about certain lies are being told or and people don't want to listen to you or or people just being ignored. So this book once again it follows a family a generation of a fam of a few families actually and I tell you it's really good. I highly recommend it. Yes it is a chunker but I promise you it is worth the read. So definitely love this book so much. The next one that I feel like is I feel like mostly it's on everybody's list and I really enjoyed this book. It had a lot of like oh my gosh type of factors in it and that is The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang. If you haven't picked this book up I recommend it but there is some co content warnings within this book so just be aware. And so then the next book which is also a book by R.F. Kuang and that's, that is Babel or some people pronounce it as Babel. <sighs> Look, I tab this book up as well. And I also have like my little notes and stuff in it on what the colors mean as I was tabbing away with it. And it follows multiple different POVs. And it just it it's interesting. It touched bases on so many different on so many different levels that I really recommend that you read. It's like a dark academia vibe to it, with also I feel like some government government intrigues you know like cities based on like politics and whatnot so it's a little heavy on that too as well I think but it's mostly dark academia which I really love anything with a school and stuff like that I'm here for it but yeah I really love this book so much so yeah so so good the next one which a lot of people aren't have mixed feelings about this particular book but I love this series so so much like the third book the ending fire just came out and so I have here The Final Strife. This is really good. This is based off of, of different characters and within the society of this particular world people are divided based on the color of their blood and pretty much what the color of their blood is that's the role that they play in this world and it's very complex but it's so freaking good. There are some content warnings in this book as well so definitely be aware of that but overall I love this book so much so it's definitely one of my picks for sure. The next one as well that I have here it's 
so freaking good it is a thriller and I feel like it I feel like every not everybody but I feel like a lot of people have read this book already um and I just after reading this book I became a huge fan of his and so any book he writes and publishes he's an auto buy for me and so we have razor blade tears by S.A. Cosby so <laughs> freaking good like there's never a moment where it's dull or it's just slow like the pacing of this book is just freaking amazing and once again like I said anything by S.A. Cosby I'm gonna be read because it's so freaking good and everybody needs to read this like they need to read it like right now and then the next book I have here definitely has some content warnings in this one as well this one is really good but it's really deep um, like even with the premise it says what does it mean for a family to lose a child they never really knew so it gets in depth into a lot of different a lot of different aspects and a lot of different themes in this book so be aware of that but the book is The Death of Vivek OG this is by Akweke and Messi their writing is phenomenal I just read their newest book that came out um, a little earlier this year and I this book was really good it was it was really deep it had me thinking about a lot of things that a lot of family members and just different cultures and what people go through when they don't feel like they are appreciated or people don't want to acknowledge who they are you know or they ignore them I find this book really good but once again there's some content warnings within this but I highly recommend this one and I just I really enjoyed this book but anything by a quick game messy I'm going to read and then the next book loved so dearly um I really need to pre-order the special editions from Orbit and that is the fifth season by N.K. Jemison so freaking good like the whole Broken Earth trilogy is amazing but this is the first book and I tell you you do not want to sleep on this series it is so freaking good I really need to reread this and tab this up even more because it takes you on a journey and with N.K. Jemison's writing especially with this series she has you confused but it's for a good reason she wants the the reader to be confused nothing is given with this series you really have to like pay attention and think things through which is why I feel like this particular series is tab worthy <laughs> because there's so many things that you could possibly miss that gives you the key to stuff now she pretty much says like hey you probably want to remember this or you probably want to take note of that so she gives you little hints now and then mostly with throughout this book and throughout the series but it, really freaking good so yeah the fifth season by N.K. Jemison next book which is also very near and dear to my heart which this is this book is written in um, poems uh written in verse really enjoyed this book this book is very it's just beautiful it talks about a story of this particular uh author's childhood and the book I'm talking about is Brown Girl Dreaming this is by Jacqueline Woodson love Jacqueline Woodson to that like love it and this book was like one of my favorites by Jacqueline love it so much and I just highly recommend it that you read it whenever you get a chance but this definitely had to be on my top 10. Then lastly another book that I know people were it was hit or miss with this one but for me it was a hit and I love this book so much this author is also an auto buy for me and that is Ace of Spades this is by Farida in Bike Mide. love this book so freaking much this is basically another book that is occurred occurring at a uh, a school and these are teenagers and they experience so much but so it but it's realistic in my personal opinion with what they go through and just being in school and being a kid and in this day and age and all other things that's happening and trying to get to be accepted for who you are and not trying to change who you are or how you look like this book was amazing. So yeah, I, it definitely made it to my top 10. And so those were my top 10 picks of the 21st century that are near and dear to my heart. And I think that everyone, if you haven't, get a chance to read these amazing books. They're all well written. They all take you on a journey. They all will put you in an emotional roller coaster. But they are I feel like the re reading these books when they take you on an emotional roller coaster they are worth the time and worth wor just worth your time and just worth of you just turning each page because once again these books are absolutely near and dear to my heart and they are page turners hands down those are my top 10 picks you guys
Bye. What an incredible lineup of books. Huge thanks to everybody who participated. I am here with my top 10. Now I know every, other people didn't give you their reasoning for how they picked it. This was such a hard list to put together. The only guidance that I gave everyone was that it had to be published the year 2000 or after any genre was fine. For myself, however, I ended up deciding to exclude nonfiction and YA just because I could not decide what to include otherwise. These are in no particular order other than sort of by genre. As you know, I read romance. I love romance. I think it's an important genre. It's the top selling genre. A Slave to Sensation by Nalini Singh. This is the first book in the Psy Changeling series. It came out in 2006 and this series is still being published today. It has had some serious longevity and I think there's good reason for that. This is also a series that I think has been a foundational text for a lot of modern romance authors that are writing today. This is not my favorite book in the series, but I think it's good and it is the first book in the series, so it's standing in for the others to come. One of the things that I think is really important about this is that for a long time in romance you would have these super intense alpha heroes and heroines who are kind of wilting flowers and that is not the case in this series. She has women who give as good as they get. Sometimes she has beta heroes, not all the time, but sometimes. But you have these really strong heroines in different ways. The Haunted Ring Light is back, if you know, you know. They are quite sexy, but they also have incredible world building. They've got sci-fi elements. There's murder mysteries going on. There's this macro political plot that is just incredible. I haven't finished the series. I've read like 16 of them at this point. I really need to keep going, but I love them. A lot of your favorite romance authors love them and I think they're really underrated. Next is a book that is a bit of a genre blend and it's the only one that is straddling nonfiction and fiction. It is a memoir but told through a variety of fiction type lenses and that is In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. This book is brilliant. It's one of the most incredible memoirs I've ever read. It's hard-hitting. It's intricately gorgeously written. It's experimental and doing something really unique and interesting. It's about domestic violence in a queer relationship. It is a memoir of the author's experience being in an abusive relationship with another woman and what it was like to be in that relationship, get into it, and eventually escape it. But it's told in the most interesting way. Each chapter or a few pages is a different subgenre. So dream house as noir, dream house as daydream, dream house as a road trip, dream house as time travel. I mean the whole thing is told through these different lenses from a literary perspective. It's just incredible. The themes are really important. This is so good. Next is a book that I read and loved before I was on YouTube and that is The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. This was an award winner and deservedly so. It's another interesting genre blend that is literary fiction with a speculative element. It reimagines the Underground Railroad as something literal that what if it was a true railroad that ran underground and it plays with time and place and memory. Thematically it's so rich. Sometimes it reads a little bit like a fever dream. It's hard hitting. It's just an incredible book and if you haven't picked it up I do recommend it. It may not be everybody's cup of tea but I thought this was amazing. I need to go faster because I am talking too much about all these books because I love them so much. Next is Circe by Madeline Miller. This is an incredible book. I could have picked Song of Achilles but this was my favorite of the two so we went with this. Madeline Miller really started off a whole slew of books that were reimagining mythology in interesting ways. I think these books were really important and this book is so gorgeously written and the way that it talks about motherhood made me feel really seen. It's retelling the story of a woman who is a witch, who is a villain, but offering a different perspective. Next is my only short story collection. I would say this is probably the best short story collection I have ever read in my life and that is The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories by Ken Liu. This is so good. It's brilliantly written. I annotated the hell out of it. It made me sob. It is a mix of science fiction and fantasy and mythology and it's just so rich. If you haven't read Ken Liu's writing it's amazing uh, but I started with this and 
I cannot say enough good things about it. And it's worth noting this book came out a while ago and is still getting talked about. So the collection came out in 2016 and for a short story collection to still be having as much traction now almost a decade later as it did that's really impressive. Next is horror. I knew that I wanted to put a book by Stephen Graham Jones on this list because he has been such a pivotal writer in the horror genre. He's an amazing indigenous writer. The book of his that I ended up deciding to go with is The Only Good Indians. This isn't the book of his that I've rated the highest but it's one of the ones that stuck with me the most and I feel like if I reread it I would probably bump the rating up. It's a book about revenge and identity and guilt and it follows these four indigenous men who did something pretty messed up and now they are being hunted down. And the pacing of this book is so interesting because it's like slow, 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 super brutally violent. Slow, 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 super brutally violent. Like he goes hard in those moments, but then it's also just so beautifully written and richly complex in terms of themes and character work. I think he is an incredible writer and I wanted to put one of his books on the list and if you haven't tried him I would recommend this. The other book that is kind of horror blended with other genres, are you seeing a theme here? I do like authors who do genre blends in interesting ways or subvert genre expectations in interesting ways and maybe are experimental. I had to include Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. This is a mix of science fiction, fantasy, and horror with lesbian main characters. And I loved this. This is definitely a strong flavor. It's not to everybody's taste, but I think what she did here from a writing perspective is just incredible. And as you go on into the rest of the series, she does really interesting experimental work with these books. If you haven't tried it, maybe give it a shot. Again, it may or may not be for you, but I think these are great and important. Finally, I have three fantasy books. Fantasy is my favorite genre, so you know there had to be some on here. And I really wanted to include Robin Hobb. I think that she is one of the greats writing today. And some of her books were written too early to be included on the list. The book that I ended up going with was The Golden Fool. This is the second book in the Tawny Man trilogy, which is the third series in the realm of the elderlings. I cannot say enough good things about her writing the world building, the character work, the thematic content, the plotting, the detail, the, the prose, all amazing. She will also rip your heart out. So I really loved this. This was my favorite book in the trilogy, maybe unpopularly so. It had a lot of politics, core politics. It had a lot of interpersonal relationship stuff happening, but her books are incredible, definitely deserve to be on this list. Then for another case of, this is not my favorite book by the author, but it is their first book. And I think it's important for them to be represented. We've got The Blade Itself by Joe Abercrombie. He writes grim dark fantasy that subverts the expected tropes of fantasy in really interesting ways and he writes incredible characters and plans out incredible intricate plots and is playing with so many ideas that are really big. This was his debut and again maybe not the best book that he's written but still a very good one and starts off the first law universe with a bang. I think that his books are amazing. Huge thanks to Liana from Liana's Library for getting me to read them and part of why I knew I had to include him. I mean I think he needed to be in this video somewhere and since Liana has had her plate full from making videos about season two of Rings of Power, she is not here to talk about Joe Abercrombie herself so in her stead I will tell you I think Joe Abercrombie is excellent. Lastly is one of my personal favorite books and I know the series is unfinished. I don't know if it will ever be finished, but I still love this book so, so much. And it had to be on here. That is The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. Love him or hate him, want to read it or want to wait because book three has not been finished. I think that this book has been very impactful in the 21st century. It's a really important example of fantasy and it's also just gorgeously written. Great memorable characters, intricate world building, lyrical prose. I mean really just oh, I love this book so much and it is one that I have reread and will probably continue to reread so had to be on there. Editing Bethany here so as it turns out we have a few duplicates on these lists. I'm gonna point out 
that there were three people who talked about the fifth season, which I love because it is one of my favorite books of all time and would have been on my list if uh, other people hadn't talked about it. But because we had four duplicates, in order to round out this list of 100 books, I thought I would take this opportunity to share with you my four top YA books that were published in the 21st century. The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo I think actually won the National Book Award and I think it really deserves it. This is a novel in verse that is a YA coming of age story following a Latine young woman who has grown up really religious and is finding herself and finding her voice. It's gorgeous, it's beautifully written, it's one that I could see being a long-lasting title that people would be reading. I've read it twice myself and it's it's just so very good. I love it. I think it deserved the award. Iron Widow by Sharon J. Zhao. I think this is so cool and so fun. It's YA sci fantasy with big sort of mega robots and a polyamorous relationship and a badass heroine who is based on a real historical queen who lived in China. I think it's really good. It wasn't expected to do as well as it did and it was kind of a breakout hit and I think is really exciting for the possibilities of this kind of a genre mashup in YA. Graceling by Kristen Kishore. Again, this is one where it's the first book in the series, not necessarily I think the best book or my favorite book in the series, but I feel like this series was really ahead of its time. It's been republished with new covers, but this originally came out more than a decade ago, back I think in like early 2000s, maybe 2011 or something. Uh, when was this published? Okay, yeah, so this first book came out in 2008. And the way it was thinking about things like consent and identity and feminism was just so far ahead of where we were at. This feels like something that would have come post Me Too in the way that it talks about sexual assault and harassment and things like that and it's just so good the fantasy world is great the characters are great i think it's an excellent series that has had real lasting power and again i think has been formative to a lot of ya authors who are writing today lastly i want to share one of my favorite ya horror books and there could be a few books that would go on this list, but this one came out several years ago and I think was pushing us in a direction that we have seen really exciting things happening in. This is Sawkill Girls by Claire Legrand. It is queer feminist horror about an island and a creepy monster that is consuming young women. And it goes hard with the horror elements, more so than a lot of books written for YA did at the time. And since then, I have seen more boundaries being pushed by people like Andrew Joseph White, who is writing incredible and really gruesome <laughs> YA horror about trans characters. And there's just a lot of cool things that have happened in this subgenre. But I feel like this book was a little bit pivotal. And maybe I, I'm back biased because I loved it so much and it spoke so much to me, but this was one I really loved. There you go, four bonuses to round out your list of 100. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found new books to read, new people to follow. Again, huge thank you to everybody who participated and sent me clips. Go check them out. They're linked down below. Go follow their channels. This video took a while to actually put together, but I'm happy that it finally did. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything we talked about in this video. And for question of the day, tell me what is one book that would go on your list if you were making a top 10 or a top 100 books of the 21st century. Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.